Okay, so what is your, how do I get on your Wi-Fi here? Well, good luck. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, so click that it's, one. It's locked up. And yeah. And the password is capital. Oh, yeah. yeah, it gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> All right, we're here today with Pastor Ray Bentley from Maranatha Chapel in San Diego, Rancho Bernardo. And, and so, Ray, you're a native San Diegan. Yes. Lived there all your life. And um, from what I know about you, I've known you for a while, you you got into ministry, mm. in fact, started a church at a very young age. T- tell yeah. me about how old you were and, and where you started and <clears throat> how long were you there and what, what in the world were you doing? I don't know that I knew exactly what I was doing, but... Um, you know, I, I got saved through Billy Graham and, and was going to church. And through high school, I mean, what was going on at that time, there was, uh, you know, literally, I, I got saved the year that there was a six-day war uh, in Israel. That same year, it was 1967, I was about yeah. 10 years of age. And uh, and so then all of a sudden, you know, we started going to church because I got saved here in Billy Graham. But then I started hearing about Jesus is coming back. And I go, what do you mean he's coming back? I, I thought, you know, he was walking with the guys with the robes on 2,000 <laughs> right, years ago. Right. You go to church and he's coming back, you know. And so that was the first time I started hearing that what was going on in Israel. I didn't know that there hadn't been in Israel for almost 2,000 years. Right. So, you know, it really was after World War II. It came together and that it was a fulfillment of prophecy. So anyway... I decided, look, I can't just live a normal Christian life, you know. Uh, if Jesus is coming back, I got to tell my buddies and my friends. So I started doing Bible studies in high school for the wrestling team, the football team, my you know friends, cheerleaders, whatever, and sharing with them, hey, you guys, you know, give them the gospel, and the kids were coming to the Lord. And then I heard about Chuck Smith. Right. And uh, I I actually, he came down to San Diego and he was speaking at this church. I said, I'd seen him in Life Magazine in this chapel in a bean field. There were thousands of people, uh, this is in the, you know, mid-70s that are, they got long hair because now I'm in high school and that was, that was kind of the deal then, you know. (laughs) Yeah. And um, the Jesus people revival that I was hearing about, especially Orange County, and it was sweeping down into San Diego. So you're you're out of high school at this time. So at this time I'm I'm out of high school and I want I wanted to be in the ministry. I felt like I want to serve the Lord somehow and when I heard Chuck I said that's what I want. I want to be a Bible teacher. Hmm. Uh, because I had grown up on lost sermons. They were good sermons, exhortation, right, you know, right. three three points and you know <laughs> and some scriptures and a poem and <laughs> and he was like, man, he went verse by verse. Yeah. And John honestly I was 18 the first time I heard Pastor Chuck teach. I remember to this day the Bible study, the context. It was in wow. John chapter 7. Out of your innermost being, gush, uh, you know, well, rivers of living water. So that really captured me. And, and I went up to Chuck and I said, where did you go to Bible college? That's where I'm going to go. I had a pen and a pen, you know, because I just graduated high school. He goes, oh, well, Ray, you know. <laughs> He never told me where he went to Bible college. He goes, uh, you know, move up to Orange County, go through the Bible with us and all. And, uh, and so, <laughs> all the, anybody that's ever been through Chuck tapes, you kind of, you yeah. hear his voice, his yeah. cadence. So I ended up moving to Orange County, moving into a house ministry wow. with about 35 other young people. Rascals! So uh, your parents think you're crazy at that time. What they, was Ray doing? They did because I was headed. I was actually going to be. I was going to a Wesleyan church. I was going to be a Wesleyan pastor, go through yeah. ordination, all yeah. that uh, process. And I said, no, no, no. I feel like I, I need to go hear this guy Chuck a teaching through the Bible. It's a revival. I want to be part of it. And they said, okay, you know. So I moved into the House of Psalms, which is in Santa Ana, California. And lived there with 35 other people that were off the streets and drugs and halfway house. And, and, and you never were a drug guy. I, mean, you, I never was. Never the, I was a drugs. church kid thrown into this <laughs> right. radical. Exp- I mean, it was actually the best year of my life to get practical training. Yeah. Uh, you know, kids that were homeless, kids that were in trouble, kids that were on drugs, kids that were, you know, doing every wild, crazy thing you can imagine. And they got saved at Calvary. And would get into this house, so we were all getting disciples. So 
I was there for about a year, and then I heard they had a Bible college. They only had one semester. I went to the Bible college. Uh, it was three months long. I met my <laughs> wife. And, that, and then they said, well, we're thinking of doing a, a second semester, but we haven't pulled the trigger on that. So we're going to pray for you guys, and God bless you. That was it. There was, was no... It graduation, no diploma. So, so were you married at that point when you well, graduated? Well, no, because I, when I went to the the, uh, the Bible college, there in three months, th that's where I met Vicki. Okay. I met okay. her at the Bible college, this beautiful young lady, and <laughs> asked her to marry me after three months. Oh, my gosh. And uh, she said yes. And so the next thing you know, you know, that in within a year, I graduated from Bible college. I got married. And within a couple of months, I said, I feel called to start a church. And I literally, at 20 years of age, uh, started a Calvary Chapel. 20 years old. 20 years old. Uh, at the high school cafeteria I had graduated from just two years prior. <laughs> That's awesome. We set up 50 folding chairs. Yep. And I went there. And it was so funny, John, <laughs> the first Sunday, it was packed because it was all my family and cousins yeah. and yeah. aunts and stuff. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the next Sunday, it went down to the 12 people or whatever. Right. But... Uh, but yeah, but God blessed it, and that was Amazing. off to the races from there. And so, so you from that stage, you you stayed involved in Calvary Chapel your the, yeah, the whole life, my whole yeah whole journey. And you 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 pastored that church, and you you were the teaching pastor at a church in San Diego with Mike McIntosh. Yes, and then you started right. Maranatha Chapel over in right. Rancho Bernardo, and you've been yeah. there how long in Rancho Bernardo? Well. Uh, you know, Maranatha Chapel started in 1984. 84. Uh, as a Bible study in a park. So that was after I had been with Mike McIntosh, uh, which was, his church was originally Calvary Chapel, San Diego. Then it became Horizon. Right. And actually, that's where I met you. Right. During those two years, <laughs> you know, this guy, yeah. Tom Hudson, was a sunglasses guy. Right, and he comes right. and he goes, you got to meet my... <laughs> you know, brother-in-law, he's a pastor, you, you'd be great, you know, so uh, that's where we met, yeah. became friends. And... Yeah. So, so you, you named your church Maranatha Chapel because yeah. of your, your strong emphasis on teaching and uh, just interest in prophecy. Yeah. And, you know, the, the word Maranatha means what? Yeah. Maranatha, it's in the Bible, right. uh, it's at the end of uh, First Corinthians, and it's an Aramaic word, an ancient Aramaic, and it means Oh, Lord, come. So Jesus said, look, I'm coming back. The last thing he said is he was coming. He ascended up into heaven from Mount of Olives. And the angels said, hey, this same Jesus is so coming again in like manner as you've seen him go. So Maranatha meant the Lord's coming. And really that message, that hope of the come, and we're to pray. Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come. Right. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've been praying it for 2,000 years. And I believe that we're living in the generation that literally is going to see it fulfilled. Yeah. So, so in, in just a moment, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on and what's happening in our world right now prophetically, because I know you you are dialed into that whole world very yeah, much. Yeah. But, but before we go there, so from the age of 20 yeah. to how old are you now? 63. So you're 63, so you've been... 43 years. You've been pastoring, been pastoring. for yeah. 43 years. So, yeah. so there's a lot of pastoral experience in this room yeah well. <laughs> so so let me just ask you this so yeah. all those years what would you say has been some of the most meaningful experiences for you as a pastor mm. well you know um the 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 discipline of actually going through the bible i mean i've taught through the bible several times right. starting in genesis and and going all the way through revelation and, you know, when you gain an appetite for just chapter by chapter, word by word, verse by verse, it has a, it influences you. It's almost like a different way of walking with God. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. Uh, you, you build a foundation, and uh, I, I just can't... I am so thankful, and I know you are too, that we had Pastor Chuck as our right. pastor... Right. And our shepherd and kind of the, he laid that foundation of going through the whole word of God. You cannot go through the whole word of God without it affecting you and changing you and piercing your heart. I feel like, you know, I've been, uh, you know, how how do you tenderize a steak? You know, you poke yeah. it with a fork, you know, a thousand <laughs> times. And in many ways, that's been the experience of being in the ministry and, and ministering to people and sharing the word 
it, it tenderizes your heart uh, in a thousand different ways. And it's the most awesome privilege in the world to walk with Jesus and point people to Jesus and mm -hmm. minister to people, you know. And So just the, the finding yourself week by week, day by day, month by month in the scriptures. Yeah. Having to teach the scriptures gives you a whole Coming. different lens on life. Yes. Transforms your own heart. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's an amazing thing. So, so after all these years of being a pastor, what are some of the, would you say, man, some of the hardest things in ministry or what? <clears throat> well, the, you know, the hard things are um, when you, you know, have been with people and you've gone through the various seasons of their life, you know, starting with doing the wedding yep. and then they've got their children, you're, bit, you're you know, dedicating them. Uh, then you're baptizing them, yeah. and then dealing with the realities of life, the people's uh, marriages that fall apart, counseling people mm. that have gone through divorce, uh, right. people's dreams that have broken, uh, their, they've lost uh, you know, their momentum, and encouraging people, speaking into people's life, hope and healing, which is, of course, in the Gospels, that's what Jesus was doing. He, he, he was constantly meeting people that were broken, disappointed, whether it's Mary Magdalene, whether it's, you know, the woman at the well, whether it's a guy that was lame his whole life. Right. And all these people are broken. And when Jesus comes in, he meets them where they are. He heals them, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and gives hope. And man, you know, well, this has been a rough year. I mean, this is, you know, for 2020 or 2021. Well, going, I get, Both. well, moving into our second tough. Yeah. Yeah. And years like I've never experienced, uh -huh. never faced these kinds of things. And boy, it, it, it just accentuates the beauty, the sweetness of Jesus to give a purpose, to give hope, uh, encouragement, don't give up, don't throw in the towel, God's on the throne, right, right. he's in charge, he is not t being taken by surprise, things are not falling apart, pr but I believe, biblically, they're falling into place yeah. exactly as he told I, us. I remember when uh, COVID first kind of came on the scene, you you and I were talking on the phone, I think, and you made a, you made a, a comment that was so uh, funny, but at the same time so true, you said, John, Remember back in the early 80s and late 70s when we were all talking about Jesus coming back and we were so excited and it was so cool and everyone was, you know, anticipating, said, now that it's almost here, it's not as fun as it <laughs> used to yeah. be. It's like, please. Yeah, because you've got all this. I mean, I, you and I, I'm, I mean, I've never lived, I'm sure you never, none of us have in a time when you have so much misinformation, disinformation, <clears throat> and you can't trust what you're hearing, yeah. and you don't know if the news is true anymore, <clears throat> and, and you're in this kind of quagmire of, what do I believe? Yeah. And you're so grateful for the scriptures oh, yeah. that you can turn to and know that are true. So, so here we are in this, uh, as you said, things are falling into place. What right. are some of the things that stick out in your mind or are kind of shout out mm. from the word that, hey, uh, this is what's falling into place. Mm. What are some of the things you think that are going on right now? Well, um, to me, you know, biblically, when you go from Genesis to Revelation, obviously the Bible focuses on Israel. Yep. That Israel is, the, is kind of the clock on the wall that tells us what time it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the previous generation that saw the rebirth of Israel, uh, the generation, you know, that saw, and we were young guys when Jerusalem was recaptured, yeah. uh, you know, because basically when Israel became a nation in 1948, most people don't, they don't realize the significance that they had half of Jerusalem, which was the Western half. And guess how many holy sites are in the Western half? Zero. They did not have the <laughs> they, Eastern half, which is 100% of the holy sites, the Temple Mount, everything is yeah. there. So 1967 really pushed the pedal to the metal on, whoa, it's time to wake up. And now we have this unique situation. And to me, this is the biggest thing that that is screaming to watch and look up for your redemption draws near is what's called the Abraham Accords. And that's something that 
Trump helped get in yeah. place, right? So the last president, uh, President Trump, got this deal in order that uh, they call the Abraham Peace Accords. Mm-hmm. And what you have is that basically, now think of it from Israel's perspective. You have uh, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And there's been a lot of history and problems between Israel and, the, and Islam. <laughs> yeah, quite a few. But uh, 85% of those, uh, you know, are Sunni and the majority of them are Arab. And the Arabs are saying, you know what? We want to make peace with Israel. We want to normalize relations with Israel. That's what the Abraham Accords are all about. So, John, if you could... Um, normalize a peaceful relationship with 85% of your former enemies, wouldn't you go for it? Sure. So that's what's happening right now. And what I like to tell people is the Abraham Accords are God is using modern geopolitics to literally drive the descendants of Ishmael, which are the Arabs, and the descendants of Isaac, which is Israel, together under the same tent so so why would father these, why would these muslims after all these years yeah. of hatred and wanting to obliterate israel and yeah, yeah, yeah. take them off the face of the why yeah, yeah. now to say hey we want to be your buddies now we want to be at peace yeah what, what would bring the other than the fact that you know the lord is doing something yes well again here's what's fascinating god is using what's happening on the ground so 85 percent are sunni many of them are are the arabs right uh, but the 15%, the, the minority mm-hmm. group, the other group of Islam is called Shia or Shiite Islam, basically Iran. Right. And you know, Iran has a ver- the small minority uh, of the Muslim world. But guess what? They are the closest to getting, you know, the nuclear weapons. Right. So I like to ask people, okay, if, is, if Iran gets nuclear weapons either by the threat of using them, like a gun to your head, Mm -hmm. or the actual use of them, who would their number one target be to use that nuclear power against? Well, you would think Israel. Yeah, people say Israel, and I go, that's a great guess, but no, they're number two. So who's their number one target? America. America, no, great answer, but that's (laughs) number three. So it must be the other Islamic group. It's the other Islamic group. Their number one target to use their nuclear threat against is Sunni Islam, which is Saudi Arabia, because they, they're at the king of, of that whole part of the world. They got both Mecca and Medina, the holiest sites. Why does Iran want to you know, threaten? Because right. you remember, they, they sent drones to blow up oil fields in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I remember that. So, there's, so why? Because they believe that the whole world needs to be Islamic. There needs to be a global Islam. But how can you have global Islam when Islam itself is divided into two camps? So the Shiites say, we should be on top. We should be in charge. We should be ruling over Mecca and Medina. And therefore, we're going to conquer you first. And then Israel is the little Satan. They're number two. And then we'll conquer the big Satan, which is America number three. So here, basically, like I I describe it like this. You know, Saudi Arabia and the Arab Gulf nations, they see that little red laser light where guys getting ready to take the kill shot. And they see that red laser light of nuclear Iran coming after them. And they're like, "Uh oh, and back in the 70s, they could say, we have our big brother, America, that will protect us. Why? Because they're interdependent upon our oil for their economy. Well, guess what? In the year 2021, America does not need one drop of oil from uh, the Gulf nations, we became a, a oil exporting nation. So they're going, uh-oh, we're kind of vulnerable. Who else do we know in our neighborhood who also has a red laser light yeah. of Iran on their chest? And some nuclear power. And some nuclear <laughs> power to defend us that yeah. we could come under their nuclear umbrella. Israel. Israel. So all of a sudden now you've got all these Arabs that are going, hey, our brothers. So, so how does Arabs. that... How does that play into the fulfillment of prophecy and the scripture uh, uh, with great question with with Israel? Yes, great question. Well, one of the biggest things we're now looking for after the rebirth of Israel, after the recapture of Jerusalem, uh, is the Temple Mount. And and the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel said, look, there's coming in the last days a surprising peace treaty mm-hmm. between Israel and her former enemies. 
And, you know, so that is the covenant with many uh, peace deal. And we've never seen this. Uh, what I say is there has not been a peace deal under the tent of Abraham between Ishmael and Isaac for 4,000 years. Yes, 4,000 years. That's pretty amazing. The last time Isaac and Ishmael were together was at their dad's funeral way back in the book of Genesis when Abraham had died. Mm. Then 4,000 years of, ah, we're at each other's throats. So now God is using the modern geopolitics of what's happening now mm -hmm. to literally drive them back. So the Arabs would go, look, we share zero genetic ties with the Iranians. They're a completely different race, right. let alone they have a totally different theology of understanding Islam. And you know, with the, with the Jews, we're actually blood brothers. We're related to them. To Abraham. So I believe that this is... You know, this is where we're at. We're at a peace deal. And now we just had um, Congress, 18 senators, nine Republican, and nine Democrats join together to say we're strengthening. This is not a partisan issue. Right. We're strengthening the Abraham Accords. We want this peace plan normalization to move forward. So, so you think that peace plan, that those... Arab Muslims mm -hmm. are going to say to the Jews in Israel, oh, we think you could build a temple. We, we think you could coexist with yes, us yes. because of this need for protection yes. and nuclear power. Yes. That this whole situation that is coming together could cause the rebirth of the temple in yes. Israel. Yes, I believe that that is the near headlines that are in the making because Saudi Arabia just made a and they're letting there's they're floating these balloons out there they're saying hey Jerusalem was never really a holy site to Islam right um, then one of the other uh, countries the United Arab Emirates is building this next year it'll be finished in 2022 a temple dedicated to the three Abrahamic faiths uh, it's going to be Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and they want shared meetings. They're going to be talking, so it's another sign within the Gulf nations that they're like, "Look, we all should be able to get together, and we should all be able to worship side by side." So where, I think, where do they want to build that? Temple? Uh, yeah, well, that that one that is for the three Abrahamic right. faiths that they're one is going to be in the United Arab Emirates. Okay, but I believe the next thing that we're going to hear is we would be okay even with the Jews rebuilding a, a place where they worship on Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be. That's going to be the shocking headline game changer because now all of a sudden we're literally moving so, into the book. So Revelation. let's say Israel builds a place for sacrifices yeah. on the Temple Mount or some type of temple. Why is that so significant? What's what's the temple? What does that say to the guy on the street? You know, well, well so Israel built a temple. What does the Bible say about yeah. a temple being built? Yeah. Again, by well, Israel. Okay, so again, the book of Daniel, chapter 9, talks about a covenant with many, Israel, her Arab neighbors, you know, that formerly were enemies, are not right. coming into a peace agreement, and they do sacrifice, and then it reveals that the, the sacrifices only last a very short period of time, and a man that the Bible identifies as the Antichrist says, stop, right. you have to stop those sacrifices. And what, you know, that you're in the middle of the book of Revelation when that happens. Right. So we're like, we're like, we're in uncharted territories <laughs> right now, moving so, forward. So the significance, it goes, it goes back to, which is amazing, goes back to this whole um, nuclear power issue. Yes. These enemies come together. They become friends. Uh, they they most likely allow them to rebuild their temple, and the scripture talks about the rebuilding of the temple before yes. Jesus comes back. Yes. The, the Antichrist steps in the middle of it. Then the Battle of Armageddon. Yeah. So we're possibly living in a time when we could see the prophecy fulfilled of Israel rebuilding their temple since they haven't had since the time of Jesus. Yes. Right? Yes. Since seventy A.D. Uh, you know, and the ultra, the Orthodox Jewish people say, look, you know, this whole thing we've had uh, for the last 2,000 years, balancing your good deeds with your bad deeds. They say, that's not in the Bible. Right. The Bible says you have to have the blood of a lamb without spot or blemish. And so we have to have sacrifice. Now, what many people don't realize is 
there was a Sanhedrin 2,000 years ago that battled with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Did you know there is a reconstituted modern Sanhedrin in operation in Israel right now? Yeah, I heard that. Did you know that they've been doing sacrifices at Passover for the last 10 years? And where do they do those sacrifices? They do it near, as close <laughs> as they can, to the Temple Mount. Right. And uh, last year they couldn't because of COVID, they didn't, wouldn't allow them. But this year, the attitude is changing, even among the uh, uh, Israeli police who used to go, no, get these guys. These are right. religious nuts. Right. They're going to light a match for a fire and, and a right. nuclear war. But now they're like, they realized... That's what everybody said. If we move our embassy in, from America, from Tel Aviv, the American embassy was not in the capital of Israel and Jerusalem. It was in Tel Aviv. And then finally we said, no, let's move it. They said their capital is Jerusalem. And nobody wanted to do it because they said it'll be nuclear war. Right. But when they moved it, it was a nothing burger. Nothing happened. There was no war. Right. So that's why now people are saying, hey, we're ready. And, and even this year, they were this close. They sacrificed lambs. And then they brought them near to the temple and they're praying. And so they, they believe, too, that we're this far away from the rebuilding of the ta tabernacle. It might right. start off with a tabernacle. Right. Right. The important thing is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And when you see sacrifice on Temple Mount, we're in the book of Revelation. Wow. So, so we're, in, we're, in a, we're in a whole different world. Totally different world. With Israel, with the Arabs, obviously with North Korea, yeah, and then there's this thing called a global pandemic. Yes, so so shifting a little bit from from Israel and prophecy, um, ministry's been different because yes. of the pandemic. I was talking to someone the other day about, you know, uh, big outreaches, um, mm. doing evangelism, maybe the way we used to do it with uh, you know concerts. That those may not be possible in the future and beginning to think about how do we do ministry mm -hmm. in a lockdown world obviously you can do uh, you know zoom you can do all kinds of uh, social media but but i think uh, also maybe just training your people to be more conscious of the fact that they have the key to the gospel yeah. and, and they've got neighbors around them and they've got friends and just being more real with your faith instead of well, the church is going to do an outreach or Pastor Ray is going to yeah. do an altar yeah. call because people aren't coming to church like they yeah. used to. Well, and, you know, what's interesting is for years, you know, we've been praying, God, we want to see, you know, like an outpouring of your spirit. We want to be like the church of the book of Acts. Right. Well, the reality is the church of the book of Acts couldn't really meet outside a lot. They had a lot of pressure and they, yeah. they were the religious were, you know, down on them. So what did they do? They had to meet in homes and underground sometimes and underground Catacombs. sometimes and and they were persecuted and and it literally was the ministry that happened behind the closed doors of a of a very intimate home that's where teaching that's where discipleship that's where all the ministry of the one another's happened from house mm. to house yeah. they had communion together they worshiped together but it was your family it was your your closest friends it was your intimate community that lived around there and hey so in a way, God has kind of answered our prayers. We're, we're back to where <laughs> home it should be treated like a church. It's a holy place. It's holy ground. Honor the Lord. Seek the Lord. Let it be a house of worship, you know? Well, your, your faith means a lot more to you when it costs you something. Right. And we've lived in such an era, you know, at least in America, where it was pretty easy to confess Christ. Yeah. There's no persecution that right. came with it. There there was no rejection. But I think in the last probably five to 10 years, you've seen a social cultural change in America where Christians are kind of looked at now somewhat as haters, uh, yeah. bigots. <clears throat> uh, you know, why do you believe all that crazy stuff in the Bible? And yeah. it's interesting to be living in that time where once Christianity was so embraced, I mean, yeah. when I went to high school, you know, everybody went to church. This is yeah. the South. You just yeah. went to church on Sunday. Nowadays, it's different. And of course, we're dealing with all the different philosophies about gender and the whole <laughs> culture has radically changed. Yes. And, and but well, yet the Bible hasn't. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that behind all of that interestingly this drive within the media and the 
push of the narrative is about tolerance. And the ironic thing is <laughs> they're extremely intolerant of people who don't agree with them. Right. Which, you know, you have to accept everything. And if you don't accept everything, we're going to pound you into the ground <laughs> because we're tolerant. Right. Uh, but, but that should be confirmation uh, that it's, you know, behind the scenes, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. There is a, I know politics have taken a lot of room in our minds and battles and discussions yeah. and debates and with people and so forth. But we got to look behind the scenes as believers. There's another layer and level that we should see into and through. As Paul said, we're not, this is not about ultimately politics. This is about spiritual battles principalities and wicked you know wickedness and behind the scenes so that's where we have to come back to the word of god and the truth of god is piercing it's double-edged it's a sword but as you said it's a key because people are trapped by these by all of these you know narratives that that the world has right, right. and many of those narratives are kind of basically denying the bible or biblical values and truths so these people are trapped and, you know, the, the enemy has them trapped. And as you said, we have the key, uh, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ that goes into your heart, transforms you, gives you love and joy and peace and the fruit of the Spirit. So let's use it. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, there, there are so many people now who, you know, in our, in our campuses or colleges who are being so indoctrinated against the Bible, against... Mm. Christian values and morals and uh, it's just a it's just an interesting time to live and and it, it makes you uh, want to you know stand up more for what you believe in the truth that you have and to live it because uh, you see the lives of so many people and yeah. how broken they are because yeah. of what they're pursuing and how shallow yeah. it is what they're pursuing and it really it really causes you to realize you know I thank the Lord for the fact that Jesus Christ is real, that mm -hmm. he does transform your heart, yeah. and you have something solid and real to turn to for truth, right. because truth is such a, yes. a misunderstood term these days, that it's your truth, it's my truth, right, who's, right. who's yeah. truth. So, so if, you, if you could, sort of as we kind of wrap this up, a couple of questions. One, um, do you have any kind of, um, say, life verse that has been a part of you your whole life or that you say you know this is one passage that you know is kind of embodies my my belief or, or that i turn to over and over again or, or anything that you would say uh other than what we've talked about with israel and what's happening with the temple that you would say you know keep your eye on this or watch for this but first of all any kind of life verse or anything like that well you know my life verse um from early high school, you know, times was Romans 12, 1 and 2. I, I love the book of Romans because Paul basically lays out the gospel, the good news of the grace of God, that we are sinners, we're broken. And, you know, that's what people, um, you know, with all these, you know, they're embracing, I believe everything is okay and anything is okay and you can be this and that, you know, whatever. Okay, great. So now that we've, uh, you know, done that, How's that working for you? <laughs> right. And what I find is people are not more peaceful and they're not more loving and more joyful. The, the fruit of what they believe is even more extreme, uh, you know, darkness or chaos or uh, depression or the, and it, it doesn't, there's no fruit. Right. Or if you do look at the fruit, it's bad fruit. <laughs> so for those who know the Lord, when you have fruit in your life of peace, and love right. and joy. It's like, hey, uh, if you would like some of this fruit, then let's go through. Jesus said it's a narrow gate. But here's what I love. It's like uh, this one guy said one time, he goes, you know, I believe that all religions are good. You know, they're, it's kind of like the wheel, that, you know, there's 360 degrees. You could be 360 gods. We all start at a different spoke, but we all end up at the same hub. Right, right. You know, so... To which they go, so what do you think of that? And I go, well, it sounds good. There's only one thing wrong with it. And they go, what? And I go, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, what happens is, yeah, you start here, 
But you all end up in the same tiny little hole of emptiness, loneliness, right. fear, guilt, shame, and all the angst that everybody is mad and chomping around about. But here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. It starts very narrow. The, do the door is extremely narrow. It starts with Jesus Christ. But once you go through that door, that's when it opens up mm. to 360 degrees of yeah. beyond your wildest dreams and imaginations. Every dream, desire, and hope can be fulfilled. So for me, the scripture is Romans 12, 1 and 2. In view of the mercy of God, our way of sacrifice and worshiping God is give him your mind yeah. to transform your thinking, give him your body, uh, you know, give him everything. Look, I give you everything that I have. That's my sacrifice. I give you me to make me a new man, to make me the man you wanted me to be or the woman that you, yeah. you have created me to be, to be your son, to be your daughter. That is the greatest way of worshiping God. And it says transformation, which is the same Greek word as transfiguration from glory to glory. Mm. So present your body a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice to God. Yeah, awesome. So so anything else as we wrap it up that... that um, you would say, as we head into this new year, we're in it, um, <clears throat> to be keeping our eye on other than, than Israel and the Temple Mount. Yeah, you know, um, I think that uh, prayer, I would encourage people, we, we need to be a people of prayer. We need to pray through everything. Mm. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Right. And I'm telling people, because they ask me all kinds of questions, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about the vaccine? Or should I do this or do that? And I tell people, look, I'm not going to tell you how to live or what to do, but I will tell you this. You better hear from God. You better hear the Holy Spirit. Don't just pick and choose from, the, yeah, this sounds good. It seems like the right thing to do. We're living in days where we need to hear the voice of the Lord. We need to have a personal, daily, intimate relationship. Hear his voice. And even as he led the church through the persecution of its first century, in the book of Acts, he can lead us through our days until we see him face to face. Now that is a great word because I think it always comes back to the intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ from the very beginning with his disciples mm -hmm. to now. It's all about, you know, hearing his voice, mm -hmm. knowing his word, being in touch with him daily. That's the only way you survive yes. your Christian walk. Mm -hmm. You can't fake it. Yeah. It has to be real, and it has to be personal, and it has yeah. to be alive. Yeah. Or, or you pretty much get dusted off the table, Yeah, <laughs> especially in the time that we live in. Yeah. And so, great. So, thank you, Ray Bentley. That was great. great to have you here.